So we can get started. It's 7.32 and I want to make sure that everybody has enough time. So, so welcome. Welcome to the third presentation of Authors Among Us. Um, it's, these are presentations that are sponsored by ICPC, which is the Intercongregational Partnership Committee. And it consists of the three congregations that share space, sacred space at 62601 Bradley Boulevard. And that would be Bethesda Jewish Congregation, Makame Ibrahim Islamic Center, and Bradley Hills Presbyterian Church. Um, tonight, as, as we're following the same format as our first two presentations, we have six authors, two from each congregation, and speaking about a wide variety of work. And each author will speak for about six or seven minutes. And so that everyone has a chance to have equal time, we will have our question and answer period after everyone speaks. So if you do have questions, please put them in the chat and Karen Levy will, will facilitate that portion of, of the program and read either read your questions or if you have have want to ask it live you can just raise your hand um so i'm i will mute every make sure that everyone is muted except for the speaker the speakers and and during the presentations and then i will ask each of the speakers to unmute when it is is there turn. Um, so without any further ado, I will, would like to introduce our first speaker, who is Nancy Allenson. Nancy is a member of BJC. She's a Maryland poet and a winner of the Bethesda 8 Trolley Poetry Bench Competition, and which is great to know because I've always noticed the poetry on those benches, and now I know who who is the author, which is wonderful. And so her other work has appeared in numerous literary publications. So Nancy, the floor is yours. Oh, thank you so much, Judy. It's really great to be here. I can hear the wind howling out there. Yeah, yeah. We'll try to create a cozy atmosphere. Um, so I wanna also thank Karen Levy with an I, my great, great friend for <laughs> Re, uh, give a presentation to the authors, and I said, oh, of course, of course, thank you, thank you. And also, um, Meryl and Alan, who have meeting for the first time, and Marty, where are you? There you are. Anyway, thank you, everybody. Uh, I have um, three books of published poetry, and the information on those books is in the chat, so I won't need to go over that again. And uh, just one other little bit of information. I retired from the federal government where I worked for several agencies, the EPA being the very last one. I retired in 2011 after over 40 years of federal service. And I was working in the area of employee training and education. Thought I would mention that. Anyway, so how did this all begin? How did I start writing poetry? When I was in high school, I took creative writing and um, we had an assignment. We were actually supposed to write a play, but I wound up writing a poem. And it had dialogue in it. And my creative writing teacher, I wrote it on yellow legal size paper. And she wrote before, uh, I think there were type, yeah, there were typewriters, but I wrote it. She wrote at the bottom of it <laughs> four words strong, keep on writing. And I took that to heart. And I've been writing ever since. And I thank Mrs. Briskin, where you are, for that. My process is varied. I've been keeping journals for um, my whole writing life. And at one point, I got rid of a lot of journals because I got as much out of them as I could, and I didn't want anyone to read them, so I destroyed them. But I use them to um, mine ideas, images for my poems. And um, uh, words very much inspire me, experiences, and also poetry prompts, and just, just experience in general. What I thought I would do is read 
four different poems if there's time or three and explain my process for each poem. And the first poem I'm going to read is from Under the Vitalpa Tree. Can everyone see that? Okay. And I just wanted to tell you a little bit about my process. My mother um, was in a nursing home for 12 years and I kept a journal. I visited her every weekend and my mother had dementia, but she was one of these people who was fortunate enough to recognize people that she knew their names and she was a great conversationalist. And uh, I had really good visits with her. And I wrote this poem because it reflects what I was really feeling that my mother was in a nursing home and she was aging, she was, she was old. And that was really getting to me. So I wrote this poem called Nocturne. And in it, you'll see images of the moon and you'll see uh, some references to aging, uh, photos and some metaphors I think you'll see as well. Nocturne. There is a spindle moon tonight, shuttered from view. I enter your room, find you sleeping. I lean over your bed, rub your warm shoulder, watch you open your eyes. There's a slip of a moon tonight, like the silver wave brushing your forehead. I pick a few strands off the dark sleeve of your gown, so easy to flick it away. Your youth is in the photo, on the night table, thick auburn hair, all swept up high, round, your face is full. Now your hair seems to wane. I can see the curve of your skull, a crescent of gray light when I look close. At your asking, I turn the handle at the foot of the bed, so icy in my hand. I roll you up. We are both safe now, mother. The spindle moon is still far away. I don't even turn on the light. And what I realized sometimes when you're writing something, I know other authors will appreciate this, you realize a lot about it after you've written. You look back and you look at it and you see things. And what I saw was the loss I was anticipating, um, my mother aging. And um, so it was really in the love I have for her. Um, she died in uh, 2014 at the age of 97. And so she's been a muse for me um, for my whole life. I want to switch gears a little bit and talk about another kind of process that I have, and that is writing from poetry prompts. And my partner, Marty Dickinson, who's away right now and can't be here, we have spent Sunday nights for a long time, especially during the pandemic, writing poems. And we realized after a year that we had enough poems to put into a book. So we put out um, What a Windstorm. Okay. <laughs> and this poem, um, well, I just want to mention the prompts and so on. We had gone to the National Ge Geographic Museum and saw some virtual formats of old Jerusalem, Israel, and other, I think, parts of the Middle East. It's been a while. And we went to Israel after that. So this is the virtual reality. Israel was much better. Virtual reality. It is so easy, put on a special headset, equipped with earphones, look down, you're entering the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, sometimes referred to as the Edicule, where the tomb of Jesus is enshrined. The tomb should be empty, periodically it is unsealed to make sure. Or put on dark glasses and watch an IMAX movie, go to the Western Wall, watch the Bar Mitzvah boy reading his Torah portion, or enter the narrow stall of a vendor inside the Damascus gate of Jerusalem and buy crosses made from olive wood, figs, rosary beads, brass menorahs, and Hanukkah candles. This reality that you can see and feel is like a dream. As soon as you take off the headset, poof, it's gone. You can imagine just about anything, it seems. I sometimes wonder if all this exposure to virtual reality all this immersion in something that feels true but isn't can somehow mess up the brain structure, damage the synapses, cause early onset dementia, or even some form of psychosis when you can't tell fact from fiction. When one day you wake up and your mind has shattered into millions of little fragments, 
like sand blowing in a windstorm. And the prompt that night was windstorm, and that's how we came up with the title. So that's another process. Do I have time for one or two more? How are we doing? Okay, I'll keep going. Um, my father made violins. I love music. I love all kinds of music. And I would go to visit him um, when they lived in Chicago and then in Florida. And he would sit at his kitchen table and he'd draw, make drawings and piece together wood. And he made all kinds of violins. He must've made about 33 of them or 30 of them. And I just had to write this poem. My father makes violins. He made his first from an old cigar box where cigars once lay side by side, a happy family sharing one bed. It fell apart in his arms. Now he searches for thin wood, less than an eighth of an inch thick, for aged wood at least 100 years old, Sitka spruce from Alaska. My father searches for abandoned wood, maple from old piano soundboards, cracked from too much pounding of the keys, old arguments pulled up inside the grain. He tries to chisel out the ghosts, wood dust falls to the floor, Memories he does not want to recall return each time he tries again. There's a lot of emotion in here from the journals I've written. There's more than about violins, but I just want to give you a sense for that. I want to end on a happy note, a happier note, I could say. Um, I love playing with words. I love the sounds, that the, the rhymes, um, everything we do with words. And I wrote this book, this book, this poem, if I can find it. Um, it's a Yiddish word. The word is nipple, K N I P L, and it means um, a nest egg or a treasure. And this poem makes me happy, and I hope it will make you happy as well. You might find yourself in a real pickle, a narrow and unlikely place to be, a moist and tangy conundrum where your thoughts ripple through your body in search of a kniffle something to dream about. Now you could add a D, an M, and a P, and wonder, what could you hide in a dimple? The last drip of a chocolate smear from the Hershey syrup bottle where you took a little sip or dip with your fingers? I say, let's find a stipple, a dapple, or a fiddle on a grouchy hill of stars and silver where a, a song is stashed away. It was made in a temple that light, it was in a temple that light was made from oil. And in the rumple of a minute, ruffled by the wind, a rainbow found a nipple. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That is so wonderful. What fun with words. Thank you so much. So I'm not sure if if some of you heard that Dilbangu is not feeling well. So her daughter tells me. Tesmia Noor will talk a little bit about her mother's book and about her mother. Tesmia? Yeah, hi everyone. Um, uh, this is her book, uh, the name of the book. Uh, can you see my book? Can you hold it up just a little bit okay. higher? There you yeah. go. Okay, the name of the book is Anna Asked Was Muhammad a Prophet? Uh, my mother, she was a, a retired professor from Bangladesh and she's uh, uh, living in USA almost like over 30 years. And uh, all through her life, I've seen her, she life, loves scripture. She loves Quran and she loves um, uh, reading Bible. And uh, she reads lo uh, lots of variety of books. But uh, lately her, the, her writings are focusing on Quran and Bible and um, finding a, a niche topic and then uh, developing the topic uh, accordingly. But this particular book uh, really started with an experience that my mother and I went, we both went to uh, Smoky Mountain. And on the way back, uh, we missed, kind of missed our bus. So we got two different seats and she sat uh, next to a wonderfully young uh, lady. Her name is Anna. Anna is like my mother's granddaughter's age. She is so young and my mother, and they become very good friend uh, in the entire trip. I was jealous and watching them a little far away. I was sitting in another, another seat. 
and they were chatting and then they really became a good friend so at one point of our conversation and, and actually she is also a student of theology and um, she asked um, my mom that whether uh, whether um, prophet is a whether muhammad is a prophet so she she came she came back home and then she wrote this book because all the ideas she collected from bible and a quran and uh, and she dedicated the book to Anna. Uh, so I'm going to read just uh, two lines from a reviewer. Her name is his name is Aaron Washington. He wrote a review on this book. Um, so that's how it goes. Um, author Dilbanu first started by defining what prophecy is. I was impressed with her detailed explanation as it made me have a deeper understanding of the definition and why God's people are referred to as a prophets. There are so many people who claim to be um, prophets in today's world. This can be confusing to believers who follow anyone who proclaims the word. The author further expounded on the subject of false prophecy with a Bible verse. Uh, the number of the Bible verse is Duet. 18 21 to 22 through that verse we learn the true prophets make correct prophecies but it is god who inspires them uh, false prophets on the other hand rely on the imagination making them fail most of the times dil urbanu's intent when writing anna asked was was muhammad the prophet was to show the link between muhammad and the prophets in the bible so that's how I want to end. Uh, this is a short introduction, but it tells talks more about the book um, and why she wrote the book. Oh, Tasmia, thank you. That is such a great origin story for that book to be sitting next to someone on the bus that, that engendered that whole process. That is really wonderful. Thank you. And I also put the uh, link on the chat. Uh, the Amazon, it's, it's available, in, uh, available in Amazon. Yeah, good old Amazon. Thank you. Um, our next speaker is Rabia Chaudhry. She is an affiliate member of, of MIIC and is an attorney, advocate, and author of the New York Times bestseller, um, Adnan's Story. And she was the executive producer of the four-part HBO documentary series, the widely seen and acclaimed The Case Against Adnan Syed. And her recent book is, my favorite title ever, Fatty Fatty Boom Boom, a memoir of food, fat, and family. Rabia? Hi, thank you guys so much for having me and good evening to everybody. Um, <clears throat> it's a real honor to be among this group. I um, So, you know, as my introduction mentioned, I am an attorney by profession. And uh, when I was in law school, I experienced um, firsthand uh, sitting through the trial that ended in a wrongful conviction of a young man who happened to be my young younger brother's best friend. His name was Adnan Sayed uh, in Baltimore. And he was 17 at the time of his arrest. And um, I spent 23 years uh, trying to help exonerate him. In tw uh, he was exonerated finally in September of this past year and he gained his freedom and charges were dropped against him. But <clears throat> as someone who became an attorney right around 9-11, um, you know, I became part of that group of young American Muslims who without wanting to became advocates and activists in the community because we were called upon to defend our community over and over again. And so um, I am a reluctant author, but I am an advocate and I've been an advocate on lots of different issues. And to be honest, um, this first book, Adnan Story, this is the paperback. Um, uh, this was also uh, a work of advocacy. Um, the purpose behind this book was to help exonerate Adnan to make the case for his freedom. It came out in 2016 and um, it did become an HBO documentary series, uh, which went well beyond the investigative work in the book itself. And, um, you know, I was we were blessed that it became a New York Times bestseller. It got incredible um, attention and uh, it did help move the case forward. It brought a lot of resources to the case. Um, and I was immediately asked by the publisher and my agent to, to write another book. Um, but the first book, I don't want to say it nearly killed me, but it nearly killed me. I mean, it the the because I was writing not just the story of 
uh, the Muslim community experiencing this arrest pre 9-11. See, after 9-11, it's widely accepted. There was a lot of discrimination against the Muslim community, especially in, in criminal justice and national security circles. People seem to forget that it actually existed before 9-11. So when this young man was arrested in 1999, um, his religion and ethnicity was brought up in his trial three more than 300 times. You know, uh, it's egregious. And so um, for for us, um, the the like the the fallout of the of the of what happened in that trial to the community was really important for me to capture in the story. I have included 17 years worth of letters between Adnan and myself as I tried to help his family navigate the appeal system. But I also it's an investigative book, so. I had the police files and I'm talking about tens of thousands of documents that I went through day by day by day and said on this day, this happened on this day, the victim disappeared on this day. And so it was a very research heavy book. I did not have a research assistant. I didn't have a ghostwriter and I had six months to complete the book. Um, and uh, and I did. And uh, so when I was asked to write another book, I thought, what can I write that will take absolutely no research? Oh, a memoir. <laughs> it's all in my head. It's my own story. Uh, the question then became, what kind of memoir did I want to write? Did I want to write about my advocacy work? Did I want to write about the public facing work that, you know, anybody who knows me knows that I've done in criminal justice. Um, and I decided, no, I wanted to tell the story that I've never talked about before, which is a story of, I'm 48 years old, um, of a, a lifetime of struggling with weight and body image issues and societal and family expectations um, to look a certain way. Uh, the fear that my family had starting when I was very little, maybe three or four years old, that she'll never get married because she's like this butterball of a kid, butterball of a girl. Um, at the same time, um, you know, there was never any malice. And, and I remember when I wrote the proposal, I said the spirit of this book is and the spirit of my family is like the family from my big fat Greek wedding. Um, you know, loving, funny, concerned, but crazy at the end of the day. <laughs> um, so the book is actually quite lighthearted and it like documents um, just chapter by chapter, like the chronology of my life, all the you know, weight issues, but also like it's rich with food stories because some of our best stories are food stories around our families and our traditions. Uh, and when you're Muslim, uh, food is almost all the fun you get to have. You're not drinking and uh, and you're not doing drugs and you're not partying any other way. Like food is it, that's all we got. Uh, so there's a lot, of, and I actually um, ended up putting 10 recipes in the back of the book. I'm a big cook. I entertain a lot. I cook for hundreds of people with my own hands. Um, and it took me in, about up until four years ago when I was 44 to finally come to terms with my body and accept it and believe that I'm worthy um, and uh, and and kind of make friends with her, make friends with my body. So it's been an incredibly gratifying experience. The book came out just this past fall um, at the same time my father was in hospice care in my home and he did pass away in December. And it was very gratifying that he got to see the book published and then I got to memorialize him and, and capture him in this book. Um, I got to do a 16 city tour and meet women, a lot of women readers, you know, from around the country, this book really resonates with. And I think one of the most gratifying things I've heard over and over again is that, Rabia, you and I have nothing in common. I'm a, I'm a white lady from the Midwest, but this is my story. Like you've told my story, everything about this resonates with me. Um, so it's been tremendous um, to be able to tell a, a very human story and and just be really vulnerable in it. Um, and yeah, and so, you know, I've got a few more books in my head, so we'll see what comes next. Thank you guys. Ah, that's wonderful. Talk about a subject that does cross all continents, all, all religions, everything. Thank you so much. So our next author is Michael Gibson. Michael is a member of BHPC, and he serves as an administrative judge with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission during the day, but he devotes his nights and weekends to researching and writing. Michael is the author of a contemporary social critique called, Can We Stop the Radical Religious Right? Michael? Well, thank you. Um... Uh, I've written three books uh, that might be of interest to you, as well as a fourth book that definitely won't be of interest to anybody. <laughs> um, the three books that you may find of interest are the one that Judy just mentioned, a short nonfiction book that I put together called Can We Stop the Radical Religious Right? Uh, and uh, I also have published two 
uh, historically accurate novels set in World War II. One is entitled The Broom Corn Field, and the other is entitled Leaving Pontotoc County. Um, the fourth book uh, that was published back in 1993 carries the catchy title, Environmental Regulation of Petroleum Spills and Wastes. <laughs> now that book was written um, right after the Exxon Valdez spill uh, about the Oil Pollution Act of 1990. But it is my understanding that to this day, it remains at the top of the bestsellers list for Insomniacs Anonymous. Um, I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have about that or any of these books. But for the next uh, amount of my time, I'm going to devote it to uh, my two World War II novels. <clears throat> and I, even though I practiced law for 33 years, and I've served as an administrative judge for the last 14 going on 15 years now, I've always been fascinated with World War II. So when my wife and I became empty nesters a little over a decade ago, I spent most of my nights and weekends immersing myself in World War II. In the course of doing that, I hit upon the idea of writing an historically accurate novel set in the war. With time though, my writing project mushroomed completely out of all proportion. And I should add to my wife's great chagrin, I realized that I actually had two novels more on that shortly. Uh, I want to talk uh, briefly, though, about the narrative structure of my historically accurate fiction. It is best described as roman fleuve, which is a <laughs> French term that literally means river novel, uh, in which the same characters appear over and over in different books. In these two novels, the lives of three young adult protagonists are interconnected. And if I can live long enough to pull this off, I'll be writing future books about these same characters and about their descendants during the post-World War II period. But real quickly, here's a synopsis of my novels. We'll begin with The Broom Cornfield whose protagonist is Virgil Davis. Uh, Virgil is a high school senior in the lead to be a class valedictorian, but he never gets to finish high school uh, because he instead enlists in the army uh, after the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. Once Virgil is in the army, he's selected to serve in the most elite fighting force of World War II, which is the 1st Ranger Battalion. Virgil also meets Dorothy Smith, a girl with whom he spends all of two minutes at a train depot, but they end up corresponding with each other and through their correspondence, they fall in love. Now, because the broom cornfield is told from Virgil's point of view, um, it is not uh, in any way an epistolary novel. But uh, at the same time, because Virgil reads closely Dorothy's letters to him, it enables the reader to see Dorothy's character develop as the war drags on. Uh, the other novel, Leaving Pontotoc County, um, features two protagonists, Meredith Knox and Phyllis Moore, both of whom I should add are Presbyterians. Um, Meredith is a rich, drop-dead, gorgeous, brilliant sorority girl who eventually marries the brother of the other protagonist uh, in this novel, uh, Phyllis. Uh, but then during the middle of the war, uh, Meredith finds herself pregnant. And so she returns to her parents' home uh, to give birth and to raise her child. And where she, while she is there, she makes a remarkable discovery about her childhood. The second protagonist, Phyllis, 
is a debutante who ends up going to college solely in order to rid herself of the boredom and isolation that she suffers once her husband goes overseas. Um, when Phyllis gets to college, she decides that it's really important to pick the most ladylike of all majors, and so she picks home economics. But she ends up becoming a dietitian and ultimately serves as an officer on a hospital ship and later on the front lines in France. But while Meredith and Phyllis are stateside, um, they are forced to cope for years uh, with the intense privations that characterized wartime America, not merely uh, rationing everything imaginable, but also trying to carve a life for themselves without their husbands. While the men who served in the war, like Virgil, were certainly heroes, it's important to realize that America's women played heroic roles as well. And their sacrifice and dedication to the war effort is one of the great untold stories of the war. One more thing as I'm getting ready to close, Judy. I am working on a script for a television series based on these two novels entitled War and Innocence. If, I, if it ever gets produced, and I'm not saying it will, but if it ever does, the series um, would be called War and Innocence. So if you or your book club uh, have are interested in any way you can check the chat there it shows my my uh, uh, website but you can also email me at mmgibsonhistory at gmail.com thank you so much thank you michael and we can say we knew you when <laughs> our next author is clint kelly dr clinton kelly um, he is a member of of Bradley Hills and has had a career in government and industry, primarily focused on computer science and robotics. Clint and his wife, Missy, photographed wildlife on every continent and in the high Arctic, including eight years of photographing all 21 species of penguins known in the world. I didn't know there were that many. Clint? Thank you. Um... I should start off by saying that I'm an engineer by education, but my wife and I, by uh, avocation, are travelers. So we spend a lot of time uh, photographing wildlife, uh, including wildlife in zoos, which can be quite challenging. Uh, in 2003, we were along the Antarctic Peninsula, uh, happened to be on a small ship with a penguin biologist and spent a lot of time uh, with him uh, learning about penguins and found them to be uh, endlessly fascinating. Uh, there are roughly 21 species. There's a bit of argument uh, about one or two, uh, but uh, they are found from the equator uh, all the way down to pretty close to the South Pole. So they, uh, as a genus, uh, encounter temperatures from over 100 degrees Fahrenheit to about 50 or 60 degrees below zero. Uh, they range in height from um, a little bit less than a foot to about three feet. Although some of their ancestors way back when uh, were probably eight to 10 feet tall. And there's been some very interesting work done in retrieving fossils of these uh, ancestral penguins. So we photographed uh, a few on that trip to Antarctica. We made a number of trips back there, I think nine in total. Uh, most penguins actually are not found in Antarctica. There are four species there that breed there. Uh, one species that's the emperor that's found there and no place else, and a fifth species, the macaroni, which some people argue is uh, also found in Antarctica, but it depends on whether or not you believe a particular island where they're found is, uh, is part of the continent uh, or not. So the book is um, good to exercise with if you're so inclined that it, uh, it weighs... Uh, eight and a half pounds. 
It's uh, 486 pages, 1,002 images, and 14 pages of maps with the requirement I put on the cartographer that every place name in the book had to appear on a map. I found it so irritating to read books and some places mentioned and they've got a map in there, but the place that's mentioned isn't on the map. So to the best of my knowledge, every place name in this book is, uh, is on the map. These are some of, the, uh, some of the images that are contained in the book. Uh, that particular penguin is the Royal Penguin found on one of the sub-Antarctic islands of Australia called Macquarie Island, uh, hard to get to. And uh, if you do get there, uh, you may not be able to land because of the water, or it may be raining hard and it's sort of hard to photograph in the rain. Um, we um, have a couple more images. These are our king penguins. Uh, the uh, second largest of the penguins. Uh, these images were taken uh, on South Georgia Island. This particular colony had tens of thousands of, uh, of penguins. It's absolutely incredible place to visit. And then one little last picture. Uh, penguins are birds, people say, but they don't fly. But occasionally they do fly. And if they have to go from point A to point B quickly, they don't swim underwater, they porpoise. And uh, it's absolutely fascinating to watch them do that. Uh, the trick, because watching them is so fascinating, is to make sure you press the button on your camera to get pictures of that fascinating behavior. And I can attest to the fact that we saw that a couple of times, and I didn't end up with a single picture because I'm just so fascinated watching them. Um, we didn't set out to do a book. Uh, we just were interested in seeing them and photographing them. Someone pointed out uh, a penguin book written by Roger Torrey Peterson, all the species that he uh, was able to photograph in 1979. Uh, but it was pretty much a penguin book written for people who uh, have great interest in all sorts of uh, habits of the birds. Uh, we read a lot of penguin literature, same thing. It was very much intended for uh, people who were doing work on penguins. And so we thought we would write one that not only had some of that material in it, but also talked a bit about the places where penguins are found and photographed not only the penguins, but other uh, material, uh, both fauna and flora that, uh, that you find with penguins. Probably the most interesting place we visited uh, because there are a lot of historic sites where you find penguins was uh, James Cook's um, uh, landing place on South Georgia Island, part of those great four voyages that he took around the world. And then visiting Scott's hut at uh, Cape Royds where he, put his team together before he headed for the uh, South Pole in 1910. And as you might recall, uh, Amundsen beat him to the pole by about 30 days. But it was eerie, the, the hut is very much as it was when, uh, when Scott was there. And uh, you could almost imagine it was a movie set and the actors had temporarily left. And in a moment, if you just stayed there, they'd all come back. I've uh, never had a feeling like that before. Uh, most interesting part of the book for us is the afterward, where we talked a lot about other places we had visited and our impressions of the status of uh, lots of species around the world. And what we find is that the endangered species, and there are too many of them, are endangered not because of climate change, although that's not universally true, but because of habitat loss. And that's true not only of penguins, but other species as well. Thank you, Clint. That's, that certainly goes across all, all of us. It's true for all animals. Thank you so much. And I, <laughs> I can't get that image of a 10 foot penguin out of my head. It's, 
pretty, that's pretty amazing. So our last speaker is Karen Levy, who is a member of BJC, and she has worked as a program planner for an international arts organization, a volunteer firefighter, and has been a teacher in the Washington, D.C. area for over 30 years. And Karen has written a children's book called Lulu Lambie. Karen? Thank you so much. Um, I'd like to thank the ICPC for inviting me to participate in this event tonight. I'm honored to be included with these more grown up books. Um, <laughs> Lulu Lammy is my first and only book, um, and the poster is behind me. Um, and my hope uh, is that people find it a relatable story. Um, I spent 30 years of my teaching um, as a fifth and sixth grade teacher. Um, so I never really thought about writing a picture book. Um, as a kid, I wrote little books um, for myself. Um, I remember painstakingly gluing notebook paper onto pieces of heavier paper and crudely making a binding. I wrote a book called Mixed Up Margie when I was about 11 about a girl who was angry at her parents for moving the family from one state to another. Hmm, sounds a little <laughs> autobiographical. Um, but my inspiration for Lulu Lammy really came from these. <laughs> these little lammies that were given to my daughter when she was very small. And one in particular, um, believe it or not, this was pink at one time. Um, and this is the lammy um, that became very important to her. Um, and so she dragged this lammy around to doctors, to the dentist, in the car, to restaurants, family events, stores, you name it. Um, so the book is about a child who's very attached to his Lammy. And this attachment is the source of some occasional criticism from family members, especially his sibling who tells the story. Um, with my own daughter taking Lammy along with us many, many times, we had our share of adventures, as you can imagine, like losing Lammy at a restaurant where it got rolled up into the tablecloth at closing time and put in a bag to go to the laundromat the next morning. Um, so you can imagine the frantic moments that ensued. Um, there are similar scenes in the story, um, though a few are dramatically enhanced, I admit. Um, I chose to have no illustrations of children, of the children in the book. Um, the only person you see is a minor character, a doctor. Um, I wanted to show that the love that a child has for these special kinds of items is universal um, and not assigned to any particular kind of group or race or gender of child. Um, I use the word lovey in my book. The, the doctor referred to the Lammy as a lovey because when I took my daughter for her four-year-old checkup and she had Lammy, the doctor said, oh, is that your lovey? Um, and I hadn't heard that before, but I guess people use that term. Um, in my book, a line that appears a few times is, don't worry, he won't take it to college, um, as people would meet Lammy along the way. Um, and we heard that more than once um, when we were dragging Lammy around. And over the years, I have learned the truth which is that many kids do take their special loveys to college. Um, and one of the final pictures in the book actually shows Lammy um, in the dorm room. Um, and uh, it's one of my favorites that the illustrator did um, because we know that many of these do end up in college. So I don't know if I'm holding it properly. There yes. we go. Yeah. That's best. <laughs> Um, right next to the Starbucks coffee cup. Um, and near the end of the book, the boy in the story laughs at his mother, deciding that she too has a lovey, her cell phone, which is typically attached to her all the time. Um, in terms of the process of writing, I was so lucky to have a little guidance from an old family friend who worked for a major publisher in New York. Um, she works with well-known authors, but she was kind enough to read my text um, and give me feedback. And in fact, she read through six edited versions of my book. 
um, and declared it a B plus at the end. Um, she told me it would be hard for even an A book to get published. Um, I sent off my text and got some lovely rejection letters from publishers. Um, and one day I received a package from a London publisher with a glitzy folder saying publishing contract, but I learned that it was sort of what's considered a vanity contract, meaning sure, they'll publish my book if I give them $3,200 and then they control everything. So I decided to self-publish um, at that point. I asked a teaching colleague who I knew was terrific at drawing if she would um, illustrate. She was flattered, but said she didn't think she was good enough. Um, and I told her that makes two of us and she agreed to work with me. Um, I used the self-publishing program at Politics and Prose Bookstore in DC. Um, I'm terrible at marketing, but my book, um, you know, did sell at part of Politics and Prose and still does. Um, and unfortunately I published, you know, just in the height of the pandemic, but I did do many readings um, over Zoom to a lot of elementary school classes and in various schools. And a very dear teacher friend and BJC member who is on this Zoom, I might add, <laughs> um, used my book in a series of music lessons um, and even wrote an accompanying song to go with the book. Um, also, one other thing I was advised to do was to have my book reviewed by a professional review company. Um, and that led to two good things. One, uh, the librarian at my school was able to get the book approved to go into school libraries in Montgomery County. Um, it was made easier by the fact that I had a professional review. Um, and the second thing that was lovely was I got notified by Kirkus, the review company, that my book was chosen to appear in an issue of their magazine, both online and in print. Um, and they said that 10% of their independent books are selected for the magazine. So it's very nice to have this tangible, you know, actual piece of paper um, with my book reviewed in it. Um, so I thank you again for the opportunity to share about my little book. Um, and since I'm finishing off and it's getting later in the evening, I will wish you all sweet dreams with a lovey by your side. <laughs> Thank you so much. That is so great. And that's another example of perseverance. So, and I love that. I love that it's okay to take your, your Lammy to college with you, because I think many of us have children who have done that. So thank you all authors so very much. You guys are all so talented and it's, I'm sure there are many questions. There's some in the chat that I think we'd like to get to if Karen wants to take over and read out some of the questions and we can start that discussion. Yes, I will. Just bear with me for a second as I go through here. Some of the people ask questions that were already answered, so I'll leave that. Um, Well, here's a simple one. We'll start out uh, for Karen Levy. How can we purchase your book? Um, sure. So it's available on the Politics and Prose website. Um, and also I sell some of them personally. And I put in the chat, it's early on in the chat. Um, it has the name of the bookstore again, and it has my email if you want to save a little bit of money, um, you, you can uh, email me and I, I sell some of them just my from myself, my own personal collection of them. Thanks for okay. asking. Great. Um, for those of you who ask questions, please check the chat because you may have had them answered. I don't want to go over those because it would be redundant. Um, here's a question for Robbie. Uh, did you find it difficult to switch from fact writing to writing about yourself? Did you find that writing about yourself left you more vulnerable for criticism or did it strengthen you from societal opinions? <clears throat> well, I mean, look, uh, even though a non-story is, is heavily um, fact-based, it had to be, I it, this is not a research book. It, there's a narrative woven throughout it 
And one of the lessons I've learned in my advocacy is if the way to really change people's hearts and minds is through storytelling. And so I actually spent about six months learning the skill and art of storytelling. I took workshops, I took classes because lawyers aren't great at it. Um, we're very technical writers. And so I had to really kind of change how I conveyed what it is I wanted to convey. And so it wasn't a huge leap in the sense that the, 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 the a non-story is definitely a heavier book. I mean, it's a it's an emotionally heavier book, um, Fatty Fatty Boom Boom, not so much. I've also done a lot of just writing over the years in general. Um, somebody mentioned, I can't remember, I'm sorry, who, uh, a teacher that inspired them. I remember I had a, my seventh grade uh, English teacher, Mr. Richards, who I wrote a short murder mystery, which is very telling, but I short, wrote a short murder mystery. And he said, if you don't have a book published by the time you're 30, my name won't be Mr. Richards. I wasn't 30. I was like in my 40s, but still, you know, at least it. So, you know, um, it, it wasn't too hard, but in, te in terms of the vulnerability, um, I'll be honest, as I was writing it, there were things that my husband and people close to me said, you shouldn't put this in, you shouldn't put this in, you shouldn't put in the fact, for example, that in 2015, I had a gastric sleeve surgery. They said, it's going to open you up for criticism and attacks. And I thought, but then it's not a, if I'm writing a memoir about food, fat, and family and about my weight loss, my weight struggle, not even weight loss, but weight struggle, it would be a lie not to do that. Um, not to include the full story. And I have not at all been criticized for any of it, attacked for any of it. Um, and I think even if I was, you know, there's a point in your life where, I mean, like you kind of don't care anymore what people have to say. Uh, I have a quite a thick skin from being on social media for a very long time. So um, no, it was very important to me to be authentic and honest. Um, and I think that's what helps people connect to your stories. Okay, this is a question uh, for Karen Levy again, and I have the same question. How did you get your book professionally reviewed? Well, I looked, I, call, I called a friend of mine who um, is actually a reporter and does a lot of book, um, you know, articles, and she gave me the name of a couple of companies, but like a lot of things, I paid for it. <laughs> um, it was a little less because it was a children's book, um, but I had to pay for someone to review it. And then there was a period of time that went by and then the review came out. It's very simple. It seemed very sort of almost bland to me, but I was told that's how a lot of them are written because it's intended for librarians and other people to make decisions about whether to carry the book. Um, but yeah, I paid, I paid for it and it was, it was a few hundred dollars. Yes, it. Um, I know the uh, for, uh, us self-published authors uh, tend to spend more than we make. <laughs> um, when I do my income tax, it's a losing business by far. Um, okay, are there any questions from the floor uh, from the uh, virtual floor? Do I see? Let's see. You can raise your hand. Virtually or for real? Um, this is a question that has to do with, it's technical. I, I love this group tonight, it was wonderful. How do we get the information from the chat? Once this goes away, there's all this information in there. How do we get it? Uh, I don't, uh, does anybody know that? That I don't know. It's a problem with Zoom, I guess. You have okay. to get it down fast. Oh, you have to save it. You can save it on the yeah. On the click on the bottom where it says uh, save. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Little arrow and it says control enter to oh to send, but there's a save. Oh, one three, as well. three, where does it go three, then? It it shows up on your computer. And so before you log off, you can just oh, take the whole oh. the whole uh, chat. I just, okay. I just click the arrow and that's it. Oh, the arrow sends. Well, and I have to go look at exactly where it is format go ahead I'll, I'll figure it out while you're doing this okay well is the did you yeah, have a question I'm sorry i got it the, the little dots you see the three little dots hit that uh -huh. and then it says save chat hit that one all right <coughs> thank you all right okay i think i saw issy's hand yeah i had a question for nancy um because 
I think a lot of people have favorite poems from their own favorite poets that they go back to in like happy times or really sad times. And I'm just wondering, <clears throat> you know, I was especially thinking about it when you read the poem about your mom and then the poem about your dad. Do you treat your own poems that way? Like, do you feel drawn to specific poems that you've written that you go back to at certain times? That's a good question. I never really thought about it before. Um, I, I do go back to Nocturne again. That's, that's one I just go back to. Um, if I'm gonna read or tell someone about a poem I've written, that's the one I pull up. Um, but I don't in general do that. Um, I read other people's poetry and get inspired by them mainly. But thanks for asking that. Um, uh, Judy, how much time do we have? We have three minutes. Oh, oh okay. Then um, I um, let me see. I just have three quick comments. One was um, Clint, I think, mentioned that it isn't so much climate change, but habitat loss. I heard that from another um, biologist who uh, is at BJC. And I find that fascinating. And um, I would like to learn more about that. And then um, the body image issue, um, Rabia, I I think it's incredible that this crosses cultures, um, this this problem. And then um, Tasmia, is she around still? Um, when you said your mother wrote about the Quran, I understand that, but did you say she also writes about the Bible as in the Old Testament, New Testament. Yes, yeah, so she um, she researched both Bible and Quran. Okay, that's fascinating. That's interesting. Yes, if you read that book, it has lots of uh, quotations from Bibles. Okay, thank you. So, Judy, you want to conclude? I think that's I it. I do. I thank you. I can't tell you how great this has been, and I'm in awe of of the, the talent in all our three congregations. It's very exciting. And if BJC can get, the BJC member can get together with Clint, I'm sure there's lots that you can be talking about. It's, <laughs> there's so much cross-fertilization and that is the whole idea behind these, um, these presentations to bring all of our congregations together to see that we have so many common interests and, and such, talent across the board it's really inspiring anyway so we have um i hope that you've all enjoyed it and i want to thank so many people and especially marilyn allen and and mary hickey whose idea this all was um and the people who helped all of us newbies with zoom and that would be elizabeth bullock and amy Cortez. And Karen for operating the question and answer. Thank you, thank you. Um, and my co-chair, Marty. Thank you, Marty. Thank you. And hopefully, and on behalf of the ICPC, and you all all welcome to join, please. Um, we want to thank you for coming and for all of your questions and for joining us tonight. And we hope to have yet another because we have not plumbed the depths of our congregation.